Hello, good morning. It's an honor to be with you all today. I'm going to see you twice uh, in the next two days. Today, talking about innovation and disruption, and tomorrow, talking about energy for Thailand. So, just so you know who I am, I'm here. I'm the co-chair of Energy at Singularity University. My background is in technology. I spent 13 years at Microsoft at a time when Microsoft was transitioning from packaged software to cloud services, and I've run a tech startup. I'm also a science fiction writer, which is an unusual uh, combination to have. So I have to think broadly about the future. In fact, my very first novel, Nexus, was inspired by my first visit to Thailand in 2004, and is set mostly uh, here in Thailand. Now, in my science fiction novels, people have a technology in their brain, sort of similar to Elon Musk's Neuralink, that allows us, if we both have this technology, to connect our brains via wire. Wi-Fi to share what we're seeing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling uh, together, one to one. It's something that you might already be familiar with, especially if you're familiar with the greatest American philosophers, like the great Keanu Reeves, who famously, when data was downloaded into his brain, said, "I know kung fu." But I bring this up. Because we have this idea that science fiction exists to predict the future. That's our model, right? But that's not usually what science fiction does. We're actually very, very, very bad at predicting. What science fiction is useful for, and what I hope this two days is useful for for you, is provoking thoughts about what the future could be like. And I'll show you the difference. Here's a classic piece of science fiction. This is Star Trek. And in Star Trek, it's a future where we can go faster than light in these starships as big as cities, but we really haven't changed. Humans are still the same as they are. Society is largely unchanged. I mean, this is what we often think of. We think of the future as doing more, bigger. But I will tell you that the way technology is changing, and some of the things that Jeff talked about this morning, and that you'll hear about for the next two years, means that the trajectory is quite different. The trajectory is not bigger; it's smaller, faster, and cheaper. This is one of the most exciting things happening in space today. This is a CubeSat. This is a 1.3 kilogram satellite that can do what one-ton satellites used to be required for a decade or two ago. It costs about 20,000 U.S. dollars to launch one of these satellites. Schools in the U.S. have launched. These satellites. We are shrinking technology through Moore's law, democratizing it by demonetizing it, bringing down the price, and giving more people access. Or here's another example of that. Jeff talked about drones, and if you thought about a drone a decade ago, this was probably your mental model of a drone. A U.S. military device, priced perhaps 10 million U.S. dollars. But when we say drone today, we don't say this. We think about this sort of device, priced more like a thousand dollars at the high end. So literally, for the price of one U.S. Reaper, you could own 10,000 of these. And that reduction in the price of technology spreads out its capabilities to more and more people. Or back to science fiction. We all know. Well, here's uh, some of these drones, Matternet, as Jeff mentioned, being used in disaster scenarios around the world. If we go back to space, here is our model of what operating in space is like from not very long ago. From right now, in fact, Luke Skywalker piloting his starship that can, can go faster than the speed of light. But this is not what. Humans in space is actually like it all, because Luke Skywalker is being replaced by computing, being replaced by software. Now, space is about the most physically demanding industry you can imagine. Think about how much energy it takes to get even a very small payload into space. It costs around 10,000 U.S. dollars per kilo right now. To get into space. Now that's being changed by companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX. How many of you have watched videos of the SpaceX launches? Let's let's show you one of these so we can we can embrace this and talk about what the innovation is here. Here's a SpaceX launch of the Falcon Heavy. 
Now, th this is a beautiful event. The thing to realize here is that this launch costs around $100 million. The fuel costs $100,000. Airlines fly at a cost of about three times fuel. So this cost should be around $300,000, not $100 million. Why is it so expensive? It's so expensive because we throw the vehicle away every time, like throwing an Airbus away. This is the magic. It's not the launch. It's the landing that is the magic. And that landing is made possible by software. That landing is made possible by computing. Let's look at a, another example, even more clear. Here's an older launch, one of their first launches of just a, a single Falcon 9, not the Falcon Heavy, about a $45 million launch. And again, normally we throw away the vehicle at the end. So think about what your ticket across the Pacific would cost you if you threw away the airplane at the end. It costs about a million dollars, perhaps. But when you watch that landing, a human being could not land a rocket on its tail like that. Luke Skywalker couldn't do that, but computing, maybe Luke Skywalker could, okay? But, but the rest of us couldn't. But computing and software makes that possible. And by making that possible, we can shrink the cost of access to space by a factor of 10 to 100. Did any of us 10 years ago think that Moore's law would reduce the cost of going into space? We didn't. I didn't, at any rate. So that's the radical change that's happening, a democratization of this. This is Mark Andreessen, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He created Netscape. He wrote the world's first real web browser, and he has this phrase, software is eating the world. We can expand that to say computing is eating the world, and if computing can eat space access, what industry can it not eat? You might think that you're in some very physical industry of heavy industry or packaged goods, or real estate, and that you're immune to the effects of technology disrupting you, but you're not. If software can disrupt space, it can disrupt you. Now, Jeff talked about these six Ds that Peter Diamandis has framed, and I want to focus on just two of them because they affect the world profoundly. The last two, the demonetization of technology and as a result, the democratization of technology, because these trends are incredibly powerful for both humanity and for business. Anyone remember this film? Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, the billionaire you love to hate. To illustrate how wealthy Gordon Gecko is, they filmed this scene. Gordon Gecko with his mobile phone, because only Billionaires could afford a phone in those days. Well, a few people below billionaire. But this phone, this is a real device. This is the Motorola Dynatac. It cost about $10,000 in today's money. It uh, took 12 hours to charge, and then it had 30 minutes of standby time. It had no camera, no apps. It had terrible reception because there were very, very few cell towers. But only the super elite could afford this toy. Here's the median mobile phone user around the world today. This is a poor farmer in Sri Lanka with his $25 Android phone that is thousands of times, tens of thousands of times more powerful than Gordon Gecko. In a middle-income country like Thailand, mobile phones became ubiquitous more than a decade ago. Smartphones are ubiquitous now. And even in low-income countries, we have 700 million phones in Africa, mostly feature phones right now. In India, we have 300 million smartphones connected to the internet, access to education, access to marketplaces, access to uh, information that no one had access to just 20 years ago. This is profoundly uplifting to the entire world. Billions of people being dragged into the modern age and the interconnected con economy by this technology. Now, you will hear sometimes people worry about uh, where technology will take us, where all this work in AI and machine learning. You might have heard Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking or even Bill Gates worry that our work in AI 
will lead to a, a bad outcome. Super powerful AIs that make decisions for humanity that we don't want. I don't believe that for a second, because this is the future of AI. It's a future of democratization, where every single one of us in our pockets has super powerful AI for pennies. That's the future. So this is the greatest time to be alive for humanity, and it's just getting better and better as this technology is plunging in price. For business, though, it comes with both upsides and downsides, and it depends on where you are. If you're an entrepreneur, this is the single best time to be alive, because while it used to take 20 years to make a billion-dollar company, now we have companies being founded around exponential technologies that reach a billion-dollar valuation in one year, two years. WhatsApp, Snapchat, cruise automation that does self-driving. Right? If you look at how many companies are there, startups that have been founded that are worth a billion U.S. dollars or more, this is the map of those, and you see it getting more and more and more crowded. And some of this is a bubble. Some of these companies will disappear, and we will never remember their names. There might be an Uber for cats here. I don't really know. And it won't matter to any of us if it ceases to exist. But many of these companies are real. And these companies are across every industry. They're across, across healthcare, uh, space access, transportation, packaged goods, real estate, every sector. And they're almost all digital and leveraging that mobile revolution and cloud revolution that's happening. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have the best odds of making a billion dollars or tens of millions, perhaps, and changing the world today than ever. All right, awesome. Well, what's the possible downside? Well, if you're an incumbent, it's a scary time. Because almost 90% of the Fortune 500 from the 1950s aren't there anymore. And the lifespan of companies at the top is dropping. The lifespan of companies on the S&P 500 used to be 60 years. Now it's one quarter of that, and it's getting lower all the time. This new technology is helping upstarts, it's helping innovators, but it's making life harder and harder for large incumbent companies. So this talk is about what you can do to be a disruptor rather than to be disrupted. And we'll talk about eight things that disruptive companies do. And I will tell you that it's not about size, power, or your war chest of money in your bank account. It's about really how fast you innovate, how agile you are in turning the ship when you need to, and your ability to build network effects that connect people and make yourself more valuable. Let me illustrate that by giving you an example from history of a conflict between two great organizations, one of them bigger, richer, better run, more powerful, and the other uh, more disorganized. I'm talking about China versus Europe. But I'm not talking about China versus Europe now, I'm talking about China versus Europe 600 years ago. China was the world's wealthiest empire that had ever been seen. It had twice the population of Europe, it had three times the GDP of Europe, and it had the world's best technology. It was also the best run. The emperor was CEO, if you will, and beneath the emperor there were 20,000 scholar bureaucrats, if you will. And those weren't chosen because of their families. They were chosen because out of 400,000 people that sat down for a test of how well they understood mathematics, science, diplomacy, economics, the 20,000 elite were chosen from that to run the organization. It's the model of the perfect organization, an amazing CEO and a great set of managers beneath. Right? Europe was a backwater. Europe had not recovered from the fall of Rome. It was beset by plague. It was small, warring city-states. And yet, from this point onward, from about 1400 onward, Europe pulled ahead and would be ahead for centuries. You had the printing press invented in Germany by Gutenberg, using almost entirely Chinese technologies. Ink, paper, metalwork, printing, 
all brought together into one hybrid machine that combined these, that revolutionized the world, presaged the internet, if you will. And that led to the Renaissance, the scientific revolution, and it led to an industrial revolution, James Watt's steam engine. And that led to an incredible pulling apart of well-being. This is per capita GDP, and you see Britain pulling ahead as China and India stay low in this for quite some time. And that's an abstract. Let me make that very concrete for you. In the mid-1800s, when England wanted to open China for trade, four British warships defeated the entire Chinese fleet in the Opium Wars. This is a bad episode in history. I will not defend the morality of this, but that was the technological edge gained by one nation over others. So why did this happen? Europe was a backwater. China was ahead in every single way. I submit that it happened because of this. Europe's disorganization was actually its asset. And when you think about technology over the next few days, think about this. Europe was a hotbed of ideas. Because Europe was split into so many different city-states and nations, each of those could cultivate its own ideas that could then intersect and crossbreed with the others, leading to a faster pace of innovation. So Europe was about bottoms up innovation. And bottoms-up innovation is not about certainty. It's not about a master plan that gets you there. It's about embracing risk, it's about tolerance for failure, and it's about high-speed experimentation. So let's go back to these uh, billion-dollar startups. Silicon Valley is the world's hub of innovation. It's not the only place that it happens, of course. But when you look at the things that have changed the world over the last two decades, they've come from Silicon Valley. But when we look at these startups, we're missing something. We're missing about 99.9% of the startups that didn't make it this far, that failed. Silicon Valley is a place where companies go to die more often than they succeed. But in that process of experimentation, we get those outputs. Let's look at it from a financial standpoint. These companies are venture-backed. How does venture capital work? Venture capital works like this. The large majority of deals, about 60% of deals, totally fail. This is not even of startups founded. This is of startups that have received a proper venture capital round, an A round, we would call it. 60% of those lead to zero output to complete failure. 6% of the money spent by venture capital leads to 60% of the gains. That's experimentation. The world's hotbed of innovation fails and fails and fails and fails. Well, sort of fails. That what we call failure, actually, that's exploring the space of the possible. That's learning. That's experimentation. Now, what about the very best venture capital funds? Because there are some venture capital funds that don't produce just a doubling of their money. They produce five times on the amount their limited partners give them or more. How do they do? Well, those are very best funds. They fail exactly as often as all the rest. They're not wizards. But their winners are much bigger because they pick companies that are more exponential, if you will, companies that are more able to leverage network effects to grow rapidly. All right, so how does that happen? It happens through experimentation, not just in the ecosystem, but in individual corporations. If you visit Amazon.com, you are subject to hundreds of experiments. Every rectangle on this screen is the result not of a master plan passed down by Jeff Bezos, but a result of hundreds or thousands of experiments that have been run to optimize where it's placed, how it looks, how many items are shown, what algorithms are used. Even just look at one little feature, the recommended books feature in Amazon. It's worth billions of dollars. Every book on this list is the result of thousands of experiments done improving these algorithms. In fact, there was one critical experiment that was unexpected that led to a massive uplift of the use of this feature. Everyone knows on a web page, uh, what part of a web page gets clicked on most? Yell it out. 
the top, somebody said, the top and the left, right? So Amazon, when Amazon first launched this feature, recommended books, when you looked at a book, it was at the top. And then one day, an engineer said, I'm just going to try something. He moved this feature to the bottom, where it should not have worked. And the click-through on this doubled. Right? It was the ability to experiment rapidly and collect those metrics that led to a long-shot experiment, leading to a massive lift in revenue for Amazon. Now, you might think, I'm not in digital. What does any of this experimentation have to do with me? Well, it happens in the physical world as well. This is uh, the America's Cup boat race. Have you ever watched these? These things are like magic to me. They're flying wings, essentially. And this high-tech race was completely revolutionized by a team that used high-throughput experimentation on physical goods. And it was Team New Zealand in 1995 with this boat, Black Magic. Black Magic is considered the most dominant boat ever in the history of the America's Cup or sailboat racing. And it's, it was a total long shot because they call it the America's Cup for a reason. From 1851 until 1995, the, an American team had won every race except for two. Okay? The American team that the New Zealand team was up against had three times the budget. They had more experienced boat makers, they had a more experienced captain and crew. And Team New Zealand really had no chance. But Team New Zealand said, okay, with our limited resources, we're going to focus. We're going to do a process of high-speed experimentation, and we're going to focus on just one thing, the keel of the boat, the part that goes underwater. And we're going to do it by, we're going to get uh, computers, these sun uh, spark stations, that were antiquated now, we're going to use them to do computational modeling of water, and we're going to use that to help shape the keel. Now, they were already behind because the American team was using supercomputers, but they did something the American team did not. The American team would try out a new keel every couple weeks. The New Zealand team built a process of high-throughput experimentation, and they said, we're going to try a new shape of the keel of our boat every day. During the day, the team would go out and race the boat. They'd come back, they'd give feedback to the keel designers. The keel designers would come up with a few new ideas of how the keel could be shaped, and they'd simulate it, they'd pick one, and then overnight, a different team would fabricate that keel and mount it on the boat. So every day, they could experiment. Their pace of experimentation was 10 times that of the American team. They had a second problem, though, because if they went out the second day and the boat was a little bit faster, a little bit slower, maybe it was the weather. Maybe the currents were different. Maybe the winds were different. They couldn't know. So they took another big gamble. They spent one-third of their budget to make a second boat. So they could race two boats against each other that were identical in every way, except the keel was different. And that process of experimentation led to the New Zealand team not just winning the America's Cup, but they won it five to zero. They won every one of the five races. That had never happened before or since. The American captain said he had never been so outclassed in his life by a less experienced captain, by a less experienced crew, with a third of his budget because the New Zealand team took this cycle of designing the product, building the product, and testing the product, and they made it short. They got more iterations through this cycle, faster experimentation, and by having that second boat, they got more accurate experimentation. We see this happening all the time. This is Beta Brand. This is a, a sort of hip clothing retailer in San Francisco, does most of their work online. If you go to Beta Brand, uh, a couple weeks ago you would have seen this shoe. And this shoe, if they got a critical mass, they'd sell this shoe. But this shoe looks okay to me. Uh, this shoe does not actually exist. They haven't built this shoe. This shoe is a digitally modeled. They work with Lee and Fung to get digital modeling of this. These photos are fabrications, right? The customer is saying, do you want this shoe, before they've even bothered to build it. This bag doesn't exist. 
This is not a real photo. This is just a mock-up. But it's a very, very accurate and faithful mock-up to what the final product would be. So Betabrand takes this cycle of design, build, test, and makes it even faster. They design it and test it, design it and test it. And by doing so, they can innovate in the market more rapidly. So that speed and accuracy of experimentation is key. All right, number three. Disruptive companies embrace failure. When you look at things like Amazon's uh, experimentation on its page, what percent of these experiments actually succeed? Less than one in a hundred. If you want to explore the space of the possible, you have to know that most of those explorations are not going to lead to an immediate success. And so Bezos tells his people, failure and innovation are inseparable twins. You're not going to get one without tolerance of failure. Seth Godin, who's a guru of innovation, talks about these three things. Fail fast and cheap. So make it easy for people. Build the platforms to make it easy to run an experiment. Fail often, try a lot of things, and fail in a way that doesn't kill you. If the Amazon engineer that moved the suggested books box from the top to the bottom, if he risked bringing down the entire Amazon website for hours, he would never have done it. You have to build the systems to make it safe for your people to run experiments one way or another. All right, four. Innovative and disruptive companies don't do a lot of asking for permission not inside the company and certainly not outside. They buy us for action and for autonomy. So in the Bay Area, we have this buzzword, permissionless innovation, innovation without asking for permission, right? What does that mean? Well, how many of us are in a situation where it's easier for someone to say no to a new initiative in your company than it is to say yes? But right? it's often asymmetric, often everyone in leadership has to all agree and say yes for something to go, but only one person can veto, right? Any one person can veto. How many of us have sat in rooms like this? I think we all have, right? These rooms are about consensus, and consensus is a very powerful thing. Consensus is vital when you're talking about the morality of your organization, the ethics of your organization, the principles of your organization. But when it comes to innovation, consensus kills. Consensus kills innovation, right? Because it's so much easier to stop something new than it is for something new to go forward. This is sort of documented by this guy, Brooks, who wrote this book about software development called The Mythical Man Month. And in The Mythical Man Month, companies that are behind on something add more people to it. Right? And that ends up having a problem. It ends up backfiring. Because the attitude often is, we know that uh, one woman can have a baby in nine months, so why don't we just add eight more women and we'll get the baby in one month? Right? But that's not how it works. And it's especially not how it works with decision makers. Because in fact, the more people you add who have to buy off, who have to give consensus, the harder it gets. And it gets harder and squared. If you have two people in a room, there's one conversation that has to happen. If you have five, there's 10. If you have 10, there's 55 connections between those people. So if you want to stop innovation, please create committees. And please, require consensus. But if you want to foster innovation, you go the other way and you focus on autonomy. Steve Jobs talked about this. He said, look, at Apple, we don't hire smart people and then tell them what to do. That would be a waste of their brain power. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. You're hiring smart people, right? Take advantage of their brain power. And this has other positive effects because people like the feeling of autonomy and freedom. Maslow, the famous psychologist, talked about his hierarchy of needs. At the bottom, physical needs, food, shelter, love, etc. And at the top, self actualization. And that's what autonomy brings. Now, Maslow probably missed a few things because really the base of the pyramid is actually uh, Wi-Fi, as Jeff said earlier today, or, or it might actually be battery life for your, your device as well. But leaving that aside, I think Maslow had a point about the top. 
there are companies that actually do this to a degree that you might not think is possible. This is Valve software. Any of you know Valve? Your kids might if they play video games. Valve is a, a company that's a unicorn. It's actually privately held. They've never taken a dollar of venture capital. It's about an $8 billion company, we think. It has 300 employees. Valve makes more money per employee than Google, Apple, or Facebook. And one of the ways that Valve works is radical autonomy. When an employee at Valve sees something that they could be doing that's more valuable, they just do it. In fact, at Valve, the desks have wheels. And why do the desks have wheels? Because if you think you should go join a different team, you unplug data and electricity, and you roll your desk over to the team, and you sit with them, and you say, hi, I'm here to help. Now, Valve is in Seattle, so I know Valve well. I, I, I was uh, at a dinner with someone from Valve the other day, and I said, come on, is it really like that? And he said, yes, but with great power comes great responsibility. You have to trust these people, and these people have to know that they can't leave things on the floor. They have to clean up their messes. They have to take care of the responsibilities they have to other teams. But that maturity is what selects for their ability to go make autonomous decisions. And collectively, Valve taps into more of the brain power of its employees than a company where someone just tells each person what to do. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go do this tomorrow uh, to your company. Uh, that probably would have disastrous effects. You need to have the right people involved. You need to have the right situation. And you probably need to be a company that's about making IP and intellectual property in some way. But maybe you can do this at the edge. Maybe there's an area of your company that you're branching into where you need creativity more than you need efficiency. That's the place to start experimenting with these more radical organizational models. All right, five. The most disruptive companies almost never disrupt the space that they're currently in. They usually disrupt somebody else's space. Right? They play offense, and that means the company that's going to disrupt you is probably not one of your current competitors. It's probably someone from an adjacent space. And here's a great example of that. We think of Apple as an incredibly disruptive company, right? We forget that Apple almost went out of business. Microsoft bailed Apple out in 1994, $50 million that Bill Gates gave Steve Jobs to keep Apple afloat in 1994. And the reason Apple needed that was that the Macintosh had about 10% share of personal computers. Now, what's the Macintosh's share of personal computers today? It's about 10%. It really hasn't changed. The Macintosh is a terrible business. It still is. Great product, terrible business. We'll get into why. When Jobs came back to Apple, he said, look, we've been banging our heads against trying to beat Microsoft, and we're failing. Let's play offense. Let's go into a different area and disrupt that with our technology and our people and our skills. And the area he picked was music. It wasn't the iPhone that saved Apple. It was before that. It was the iPod. Because Jobs said, look, I think we can do a better job than anybody else in music. And that was a crazy thing to say, because who was the king of music at this time? It was one of the most innovative companies on planet Earth. It was Sony. Sony had invented the Walkman. Sony had caught up with new technology and had the Discman, right? That's not a lightweight. This is not an easy company to go up against. But Jobs said, look, I think we can do a couple things. I think instead of having to buy one album, you can buy one song at a time. Any song, 99 cents, we'll sell it to you. And I think instead of being limited to 12 songs on your device, we're going to make amazing progress. The iPod will be able to store 100 songs on your device, which was a very, very big deal there. And so that is what saved Apple and what disrupted Sony. It was the adjacent possible. It was what was adjacent to Apple in terms of their technology and their skill set and their people. But to Sony, it was a bolt out of the blue. Sony thought maybe the competition would come from Panasonic. They didn't think the competition would come from a computer company. Right? That's who your competition is, someone you may never have heard of. All right, six. Anyone know this person? 
There's not a lot of ice hockey in, in Thailand, is there? This is uh, possibly the greatest hockey player of all time. His name is Wayne Gretzky. He's sometimes called the great one. And Gretzky was asked once, Wayne, why is it that you're so good at hockey? What do you do differently? He says, well, I don't skate where the puck is. I skate where the puck is going to be. That's easier said than done, right? But hopefully these two days will give you a better idea of how to anticipate that. Jeff talked about Moore's Law, the exponential increase in computing per dollar. And it turns out Moore's Law ends up applying to many adjacent fields. Consider uh, photography. The fall of Kodak is well known, right? Kodak invented the digital camera. This is Steve Sasson. In 1975, he presented this digital camera to Kodak's board. And Kodak's board rightly said this camera was not a viable consumer product because it cost something like $10,000. Its resolution was 100 pixels by 100 pixels. It took 23 seconds to take one exposure, and it could store one picture on its, on its drive. Right? That's not a good product. But what they neglected was the pace at which this product, the underlying technology, was improving. Because just like Moore's Law, the number of pixels you can get in a digital camera sensor per dollar goes up by about a factor of 100 each decade. And so they didn't see how that would be advancing. As Jeff talked about, we get stuck in this zone of disappointment with an exponential technology, and we fail to see how it's going to get rapidly and rapidly better. And Kodak made that mistake. Google works the opposite. Google tells its engineers, what would you do if computing was free? What would you do if storage was free? Because they know if an engineer at Google comes in and says, I have this project, but it costs 10 times too much, well, in five years, the cost will have dropped by a factor of 10. In 10 years, the cost will have dropped by a factor of 100. And now you'll have a 90% margin on this product. That's skating where the puck will be. And so that's allowed Google to do crazy things. Did any of you use email before Gmail? I was on Hotmail. I remember the day I had a 10 megabyte uh, mailbox. I remember the day that Google announced and said that you would have one gigabyte of email. Now, anybody know what day of the year that was? It was April 1st. And Google is famous for their April Fool's jokes. So the internet was full of these articles saying, maybe this is a joke. But it wasn't. It was Google skating to where the puck would be. So as you look at all of these technologies over the next two days, the ones that are relevant to your sector, ask yourself, where will that puck be? And what will you do when it gets there? What business model will you build if computing is 1 100th the price that it is today, if energy keeps dropping in price? That's the question to ask to future-proof yourself. All right. Seven, and we're closing in here. Disruptive companies change the business model. There are some companies that are commodities business model, sell ore or oil. There are some companies that are product business models or service business models. That's not disruptors. Disruptive business models are almost always focused on data, on building platforms, on building network effects, and on building virtuous cycles, where every customer or partner you get makes the entire suite of services you offer more valuable to every other product, uh, customer, or partner. Microsoft perfected this with Windows. Every person who bought Windows made it more attractive for an app developer to write a program for Windows. Every program written for Windows made it more attractive for businesses and consumers to buy Windows. This is why Apple could never unseat Windows with the Mac OS. So Apple had to jump a level. Existing platforms are almost never disrupted. Apple had to build a new platform based on mobility, borrowing all the tricks that Microsoft had done and then adding one of their own. Apple makes 30% off each app that you buy, right? moving up one level. Facebook leverages the same thing, but there's no uh, difference between supplier and customer. It's just what we call Metcalfe's Law, which is the value of a network is equal to the square of the number of people on it. If Facebook grows by a factor of 10, the value of their network grows up by a factor of 100. 
That's what a network effect is about. Now, Andreessen, I showed you his picture before. He said software is eating the world, but I would take that a step further. What's actually happening is that networks are eating the world. Network effects are eating the world. And I'll show you that vividly. You all know this company, Uber, recently uh, merged with Grab here in Thailand. Uber is arguably the world's most valuable transportation company on Earth. Uber owns no cars. It's not because of that asset. So why is Uber so valuable? Is it because they have an app? Is this app worth $69 billion? How much would it cost you to reproduce Uber's app? A few hundred thousand dollars at most? The app isn't why. Is it because of other exponential technologies? Maybe it's because of GPS or uh, online payments or ratings and reviews or the automobile? No. Uber invented none of those. Exponential companies don't have to invent exponential technologies. What Uber actually has is two things. They made a great user experience that made it far better to transport yourself this way than it did to use a taxi. And then they built a network effect. And that network effect is the actual value. You can go reproduce Uber's app or Grab's app, but you're too late. That network effect is there. Because Uber or Grab or Ola in India have the advantage that as they get more customers in an area, there's more people opening the app. As more people open the app, that makes it more attractive for drivers to sign up. As there's more drivers in the area, there's more likely to be a driver close to you, which makes the wait time shorter, which makes it more likely for a customer to open the app. Airbnb, most valuable hospitality company in the world, owns no buildings, owns no real estate. Does their website and app make them worth $31 billion? No. You could rebuild that yourself for a few hundred thousand dollars. What's valuable is the network. Every person searching for lodging on Airbnb makes it more attractive for them to list their property. Every host listing their property makes it more attractive to customers to come and search their guests. That self-reinforcing network, that double-sided marketplace, is the asset. Now, again, this is digital. Does that mean if you're in a physical goods business, you can't leverage this? No, you can leverage it. Here's Tesla. Tesla is in a fight for its life with Google and Uber and everyone else to be the first company to sell really effective or provide really effective self-driving vehicles. I'll talk more about this tomorrow. Here's Tesla, uh, software they've not released yet, running on a 2017 uh, Tesla Model S. They've recently announced that they're going to auto-upgrade over the internet most of their Model S's to have this software. What Tesla says its critical advantage is, is the data coming off of every Tesla that's out there. Because every Tesla is creating data exhaust. Right? They have no, uh, no traditional exhaust, because they're electric, but they exhaust lots of data. And every mile driven by a Tesla is data collected by Tesla the corporation, which is training data for their machine learning and AI models to make the driving better. This is their head of, of autonomous driving, uh, Sterling Anderson here. And what he talks about is what fleet learning, which is that the, as the fleet drives, the entire fleet gets more intelligent. And in fact, they're probably up to about 10 billion electric miles today, more than anyone else in the marketplace. So this is a physical good that's benefiting from a network effect. All right, the final one. Disruptive companies have the courage to do the hardest thing of all, which is to disrupt themselves. I talked about Kodak, but the reason I gave you for why they failed is actually not really that important. Kodak eventually figured out that digital cameras were here to stay. Here's why Kodak failed. Kodak's main profit driver wasn't cameras, it was film. And when Steve Sasson brought in that digital camera, he called it a filmless camera. He wrote his memoirs, he said that was his greatest mistake in life ever. Because sitting around that table was the vice president that owned the P&L for selling film. What do you think that vice president's reaction was to the creation of a device that would take his entire business unit to zero? Was he excited? Let's do this. Let's crush our revenue in our most profitable sector. No. Kodak was trapped 
in its own existing business model and couldn't say it, see its way clear to a better business model. It's happened in other sectors. It's happened in music, right? In music, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. If we go back 10, 15 years, here are the world's leading companies in music, right? And they sold us music in this form. I still have a few of these. I haven't opened one in, in many years now. And the revenues in the music industry, it's been troublesome. It's gone down from its peak of almost 25 billion US dollars in this industry. It's dropped, and especially that dark blue area, physical media sales have dropped in revenue by a factor of five. Right? But there's good news. If you look closely, the last few years, from 2014 up, the music industry as a whole has been growing again. And it's been growing because of digital music, and in particular, because of streaming. And there's every reason to believe that in five or 10 years, the music industry will be at all-time highs of revenue, and life will be good. So, of course, these companies were all smart enough to make that transition, right? No. What did these companies do when they saw digital music coming? They fought it tooth and nail. They went to the capitals of the world and they said, this is piracy, this is theft, we have to stop people. Even though they knew that customers loved it, even though they knew that bandwidth was getting cheaper, devices were getting faster, it was inevitable that people were going to download music. But instead of trying to get a piece of that new business, they did everything they did, everything they could to stifle it. And so these are the leaders in music now. There are a few companies that have had the courage to disrupt themselves. Netflix once sent you DVDs in the mail. They switched to delivering them online. Their stock price dropped by three quarters. Now it's up about 500% from them. They saw that it was inevitable. They had the courage. Amazon has done it twice. Bezos opened up the Amazon store to let third parties sell on Amazon. The stockholders rebelled. They said, this is crazy, Jeff but now more than half of Amazon's sales come from third-party merchants. He did it a second time. He said, we're going to open up every bit of Amazon's cloud technology and let third parties use it. People said, that's crazy. You've built all this technology for a proprietary advantage. Why would you let somebody else use it? He said, because someone is going to build the cloud OS for other people to use. And now Amazon Web Services provides essentially 100% of Amazon's profit and as their fastest growing business, right? So that is my last message to you. When a startup is formed in your sector, the startup is not going to ask your permission if they can disrupt you. Your employees will. Your employees will come and say, I have a great idea. And you'll say, that's scary to our current business. Let's not do that. That is the wrong response. If you want to survive in the decades to come, you have to have the courage to disrupt yourself. That's the only way there is. So I'll leave you with those eight things and with one final thought from Charles Darwin, who coined the theory of evolution and survival of the fittest. Darwin actually said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's not even the smartest of the species that survives. It's the one that is most responsive to change. And I hope that you will be the ones most responsive to change. Thank you very much.